Hi everyone, uh, uh, welcome to this symposium on inequality in education. I'm so happy to see so many people here in this room and also so many people online uh, via Zoom. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Um, we all organized this symposium because inequality really is one of the most uh, defining challenges uh, of our time. Uh, all around the world we see that kids from poor and working class backgrounds are far more likely to underperform in education uh, than kids from uh, uh, middle class and affluent backgrounds. And this gap has continued to increase over the past 50 years, and this increase has only accelerated uh, due to COVID and the school, co the school closures that it has, uh, it has caused. So what are the causes of inequality, um, and what can we do to reduce inequality? Um, and these are the questions that we want to discuss in this symposium um, from an interdisciplinary perspective. Uh, so we have talks from uh, a sociologist, an applied developmental psychologist, and a developmental slash social psychologist today. Um, so before we get started, I want to send a big thank you to the, uh, the KNAW, the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, for funding this symposium uh, through an early career partnership. Um, also to YIELD, uh, the research priority area uh, of the University of Amsterdam, for, fu for making a financial contribution and to um, the Scientific Organizing Committee for helping me organize uh, this event. So, a uh, big thank you to you all, and also a uh, big thank you to the speakers, because we have uh, three amazing speakers today um, from the UK and the US uh, who join us uh, virtually today. Uh, Mike Savage uh, from the London School of Economics, and Sharon Wolf uh, from the University of Pennsylvania, and David Jaeger from the University of Texas uh, at Austin. Um, before we get started, uh, I want to say we will have a Q&A and discussion after the talks. Uh, and if you have a question if, and you're in this room, uh, please go to the microphone over there um, um, to ask your question. Please join the, this discussion. Um, and if you join online, feel free to just raise your hand using the raise hand uh, button in your screen. And um, uh, you will be able to unmute yourself and ask your question to the speakers directly. Um, finally, um, this meeting is being recorded and it will be published uh, online afterwards. So if you don't want just yourself to be visible in the recording, don't use your camera. And if you're in this room and you don't want to be recorded, uh, please sit in the back. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce today's first speaker, Mike Savage. Um, Professor Savage is a sociologist and he's Martin White Professor at the London School of Economics. And between 2015 and 2020, uh, he was the director of uh, LSE's International Inequalities Institute. He is one of the most influential sociologists of our time and his work focuses on social stratification um, and inequality. And he has really contributed to the revival of the sociology of social class uh, in recent decades. Professor Savage uh, was elected a fellow in the British Academy and, um, and the United Kingdom's National Academy for the Humanities and Social Sciences. He wrote many books. Um, I can't list them all, unfortunately, but three uh, really influential books are uh, so Social Class in the 21st uh, Century, uh, Rethinking Class, and Culture, Class, and Distinction. Uh, and in his talk, uh, Professor Savage will uh, discuss the role of, social, of cultural capital and elitism. Uh, in educational inequality. Thank you for joining us, uh, Mike. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, shame it's still on Zoom, but um, anyway, never mind. Let me let me make a start. Uh, and I want to, yes, I hope you can see my screen. Um, I should explain at the beginning that uh, I'm interested in education. Uh, but unlike Sharon and David, I'm not an expert in education. I'm a, I'm a sociologist with general interest in inequality. Um, and so my, my talk tonight isn't going to be detailed reflection on education itself. It's going to be more the, more the context of inequality and social class divisions in our time. But I particularly want to focus on this concept of cultural capital, which is a concept, I'm, I'm going to explain this in a minute for those who are not familiar with it, it's a concept which has, has a, had a lot of resonance in educational studies to explain why certain kinds of inequalities have remained so powerful because of the hold of particular kinds of cultural resources 
amongst privileged kids of various kinds. And I want to review the debate about, about cultural capital. I want to do that by placing the concept in its, in its uh, context, returning initially to the ideas of Pierre Bourdieu, the French sociologist who introduced the concept about 50 years ago, a bit more than 50 years ago. Um, but I want to make the point, this is the kind of key point of my talk in a way, is that Pierre Bourdieu developed the concept at a particular moment in time, the 1960s, 1970s. Um, and since then, the concept has become massively researched. And there are all sorts of ways of measuring it, using survey instruments, experiments, um, administrative and data analysis and such like. Really important work, but we need to recognize that that concept was developed in a particular moment in time, which is not our moment in time. And so it's really vital to understand the world is changing. And in particular, the world is becoming more economically unequal. That's a sweeping comment, and I could caveat it and qualify it, but I think it's okay to leave it in a general way. Um, and this is, this is a major theme of my book, The Return of Inequality, which came out last year, uh, where I'm going to be taking some themes from in this uh, discussion today. So in a sense, I want to stand back from detailed measurement issues and encourage us all to think about cultural capital as a notion which needs to be historically contextualized and rethought in the 21st century. And I'm gonna try and whiz you through some of the issues around that. So let's just talk first, first five minutes about Bourdieu's original concept of cultural capital. And apologies to those of you, probably most of you who are familiar with Bourdieu, you, may, you might find this a bit uh, repetitive, but I don't want to assume you do know too much, if anything about Bourdieu's original arguments about cultural capital. Uh, what's important is that the notion of cultural capital comes from Pierre Bourdieu reflecting upon what was happening in French society in the 1960s. This was a period in time when there was a, a considerable expansion of education provision in post-war France, and just as now, a lot of hope around how that would equalize French society. So it's a very common feature of uh, policymakers, politicians of all political strikes say education is a good thing. The more education, the better. Um, you know, the more people get educated, isn't, isn't that a good thing? And of course, you know, I, mean, I wouldn't deny that in some respects, but Bourdieu emphasized in the context of many French people going to university, many French uh, youngsters going to university for the first time in their family, that yes, they, they were optimistic about their futures, but in fact, uh, they should not expect this to lead to equalization. And in fact, the expansion of education could generate new forms of domination, new forms of inequality. Why do you think that? Um, well, his argument boils down to this phrase that can kinesthetic. What does education do? And who performs well in the educational process? At the time Bourdieu was writing, he was interested in the way in which certain kinds of pupils from predominantly middle-class, upper-class backgrounds with the right kind of privileged resources could stand back from the nitty-gritty of daily life. They had the privilege, the luxury, to think about things abstractly in a way which is not about immediate contingencies of daily life. And that ability to stand outside daily reality uh, permitted you to see things in more timeless, abstract terms, more universal terms. He called that the scholastic point of view. It's the capacity to see things from a distance. And that capacity depends on certain privileges. If you are struggling to make ends meet, uh, if you're struggling to put food on the table, you don't have the luxury, and you're not able to see things from a scholastic point of view. Uh, if you have privileges, you can do that, and that permits you the resources and the capacities to do well in education. Um, and he has various quotes and various ways of, it, of fleshing that out. Um, and a really fundamental feature is, is to note this, this is a full domination which is often not recognized. It, well, it's almost inherently not recognized because we often see 
cultural um, uh, activities, cultural artifacts, which are seen to be universal as being good, good things. You know, something which is seen to be timeless is generally seen to be you know, really, really great culture. Bourdieu's point is that actually the opposite, to say that is a sign that it is marked by privilege. Now, the key point I want to bring out here is that Bourdieu's model is based on the notion of the humanities. His focus is around uh, musical taste, taste for reading, taste for going to the museums, art galleries. Um, it's about a certain notion of education and culture, which was pre-digital, largely pre-technical, um, not very social, not very important around the social sciences, and it is not characteristic, arguably, of curriculum these days in many educational contexts. Now, for Bourdieu, I want to deepen this understanding of cultural capital a bit, because it all boils down to his concern with inheritance. What does it mean to be privileged in society? Um, what does it mean to talk about inequality? Key feature is how do you pass on your privileges intergenerationally? Um, and Bourdieu makes this really important point that for much of human history, that process of inheritance takes place through the direct transmission of economic resources of one kind or another. Uh, you know, heirlooms, savings, your houses, property. Um, you know, in your will, in people's wills, you state, these are my goods and assets, and these are being passed on to the following people. It's very direct. You can see that form of inheritance in a very concrete way. But what Bourdieu points to is the, is the kind of paradox that in contemporary 20th century modern societies, this kind of economic inheritance is being uh, supplanted, or at least, you know, it's being uh, juxtaposed by inheritance through cultural capital, which is much more difficult to detect. You cannot pass on your degree certificate to your children. It's yours. The children have to earn it. And so this kind of inheritance is not as obvious, and that makes it more powerful. It's also pluralistic. You know, not all privileged kids do well in schools, and some kids from working class backgrounds do do well at school. So it becomes much more opaque how inheritance uh, operates. And for Bourdieu, that is precisely why inheritance through cultural capital is so powerful, because it is misrecognized as meritocracy. As you know, if you work hard, if you study hard, you will get on. And that's why Bourdieu's model of social space, and this is a complicated table. If you're Bourdieu fans, you will know this table, you know this figure inside out. It's one of the most famous in post-war social science it comes from his book Distinction. It's basically a cluster analysis of French lifestyles in the 1970s, and all the labels in brown indicate various kinds of tastes for artists, for cars, and holidays. Don't need to worry about details. But the big point he makes is that in French society in the 70s, there was this tension between what he calls industrialists, people with money, people with resources versus intellectuals, people with cultural capital who were not necessarily well off. And the people with cultural capital, highly educated people, artists, you know, whether what they, they saw themselves as being superior in many respects to industrialists because they had culture, they knew what taste was. Um, and this tension, very important, and much work inspired by Bourdieu, including mine, sees this as a really important point, which is making the point that when we understand inequality, it's not just about you know, top and bottom, people with resources against people without resources, it's also within different horizontal layers. People, you know, who from middle class backgrounds who may have lots of cultural capital and lots of versus lots of economic capital. And it's complex, it's a multi-dimensional space to use Bourdieu's phrases. Okay, that's a very brief, uh, you know, framing of Bourdieu in historical perspective. Now, 50 years on, how does that all stand up? Now, there's a vast amount of research in educational studies, which I'm not really going to go into in detail. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not an expert, but partly I want to stand back and ask some very general questions about how societies have changed since Bourdieu wrote. And again, this is returning to 
my book, which came out last year, where you know I try and synthesize a lot of research from economics and political science and sociology on this issue. And I want to just put, so I think we really need to bring into the discussion immediately the work of some of the economists who've written about changing inequality trends in various nations and across the world. And the key economist, very influential um, on myself, I'm not, I mean, I'm not an economist, I don't really understand economics, but one of the great values of the work of Piketty is he makes it quite accessible. And one of the ways, one of the ways in which he makes it accessible is by finding quite, finding quite neat ways of, of representing trends, which most of us, all of us can understand. And one of the most famous innovations which he and his colleagues have introduced is this notion of income shares and the top 1%. How much of the national income of any country is taken by the top 1% of earners? And obviously the higher that is, the more unequal those societies are. And on this graph, I've just extracted some recent data from the World Inequality Database, which actually helps to, to run, which looks at the trends in um, five countries, and I include the Netherlands here, given to the Dutch audience. Because, um, you know, there's a bit of variation here. Uh, but there's a common trend, which is the trend he really picks up on, which is from 1920 to the 1980s, is a positive story. Societies are becoming more equal. The top 1% are earning a lower proportion of national income in, every, in all these four countries, but we have data. Five, oh, sorry, five countries. Um, and this, this is at the same time as it, the economies are growing. So economic growth is going hand in hand with more equality or less inequality. Um, but crucial point, since the 1980s, that has changed. We've gone into reverse. We're now seeing a situation where the top 1% have uh, taken a higher portion of income again. Bringing back to Bourdieu, we need to recognise that Bourdieu was writing in that period between 1960 and 1980 when inequality was at its lowest. What does that mean for Bourdieu's thinking of cultural capital? I'm going to draw that out in a minute. But it is to point out that we are now moving back to a world where the top 1% are doing well. It does vary. The US is the outlier here. UK is also, UK used to be one of the most equal countries in the world. We're now one of the more unequal. The Netherlands is the outlier here. The Netherlands, by this metric, has not seen much of an increase in inequality. And that might be an interesting thing to discuss. Not that I'm an expert in the Netherlands to recognise that, that the top 1% have not pulled away in the Netherlands as much as in um, other countries. But second point, of Piketty's work, which in some ways I, I find really important, even more important than the, the previous slide, is what he calls the wealth income ratio. Um, and his point here is economies can be understood in terms of you know how much income is being earned in a country or generated in a country. That's you know, GDP. We all use the GDP figures and you can see growth rates and occasionally recessions and such like. Um, but on the whole, there's been it large amount of economic growth in the world, particularly in the emerging economies, China and India in recent decades. Uh, but there's also um, what he calls capital, or wealth, assets, the stock of value, the stock of monetized value, which is also part of any economy. Money which is tied up in things like housing, in your savings, in your pension funds. And in every country, Certainly on this, on this um, graph, the amount of wealth is increasing compared to that trade. I always find this a really powerful slide because we often think about modern economies as being supercharged and you know, driven by instantaneous calculations by financiers and by Google and by all these things, which of course is true, but we shouldn't also forget the fact that there's also uh, the return of high levels of capital and capital is accumulated resources from the past. You know, we've seen this, of course, in play out in the current conflict between Russia and Ukraine, when people talk about the significance of Russian oligarchs. The oligarchs took much of their resources in the 1990s when uh, you know, Russia massively liberalized very quickly, and there's a huge sell off to a small number of people. And now these resources are being used. Oh, I don't know, not now, but in recent years they've been used by these oligarchs in various kinds of ways. 
So actually, um, wealth is a, the rise of economic wealth, return of economic wealth is a really significant play. And this is where Piketty makes his really interesting comment on Bourdieu's work. You know, Piketty was influenced by Bourdieu and sees himself as working within the Bourdieuian tradition in a way. And he makes this point, you know, when Bourdieu was writing distinction, he was writing at a point when economic inequality was at its lowest, and when this wealth uh, income ratio is also pretty low. And in that situation, you might imagine that cultural capital would be really important, because economic capital was not that intense, if you like. But now, and I've highlighted the passage here in red, you know, we've now seen a return to periods, to situations of massive inequality. Um, what does that mean for cultural capital? I think, it, I think we have to recognise it in that context, the way cultural capital operates is going to be different from the way Bourdieu diagnosed it um, uh, 30 or 40 years ago. How? I mean, well, if you're interested in this, read my book, where I've got several, you know, a lot of discussion. I've got to give you 10 minutes on this, even less perhaps. But the, the, key, the key feature for Sydney is, is stretched up the class structure. It's quite a bigger divide between elites at the top and, you know, uh, the group we call the precariat at the bottom. So, you know, the compressed class structure has now massively expanded. And this is something which came out in our research on the Great British Class Survey uh, about 10 years ago, where we worked with the BBC on a very large web survey of um, economic, social and cultural capital in the UK. And we applied a Bourdieu capital model and we had measures of economic, social, and cultural capital. And we inductively derived the, the main classification of classes. Now, I don't know how easy it is to see, but this is, this, is the, this, is the, this is the schema we came up with. Now, I should say the Great British Class Survey is controversial. Some people don't like it. It's certainly, it's certainly different from classifying class by occupation, which is the conventional approach. But it gives you an interesting angle, which is what we found at the top of British society is there is a small elite. A um, few percent who are characterized by just having disproportionate amounts of economic capital, but also a huge amounts of cultural capital and social capital. And at the bottom, we found a group which we call the precariat, following the term used by Guy Standing, an economist, who are characterized by basically just having very little of any kind of capital, very little resource of any kind. Um, and within the middle, you get these more diffused classes, if you like, who have mixtures of capitals. Um, but there's no clear dividing line between middle and working class, as was often thought by sociologists. Um, so kind of co complexity in the middle, but the pulling apart of the extremes. Now, I don't want to get hung up on, I've been involved in a huge debate about this class theme, and plenty of people don't like it. But I, I, I mean, I would still defend the, the overall heuristic, if you like. And there's plenty of research done across many parts of the world, which argue that if we think about class in terms of your stock of capital, economic capital, but also cultural capital and social capital, you can see this pulling apart of classes. And in particular, this notion that many societies now have a small elite. I mean, there's all been elites. Elites aren't new, but elites have much more wealth than they used to. Um, and then you can have a large, large group who have very little, the precariat, as it's often called, you have a large number of people who are kind of middle class, working class, um, and this should be true even in affluent societies, even in the United States, UK, Germany. People who are holding down jobs, owning homes, but it all depends on balancing out. They, you know, month by month. If you lose your job, you could lose your home, and, and then it stretches quite a long way up the class structure. So, there's actually, not many people who are that secure, even if you, even if you're making ends meet. There's also a group which Piketty calls the patrimonial middle class, you know, 20%, 30% of the richer countries, who are people who, um, the term patrimonial means they can expect to inherit some significant resources in their life. Not elite, not, not massive multi-million pound or euro uh, stocks of money, but significant amounts of money. And they're also in this group of having a significant asset base to draw upon. Now, I want to just briefly say a few words about these top end effects. It follows from Piketty, Piketty's argument and, and my own reflections about the stretching of class structure that 
you're finding these quite dramatic uh, shifts at the top end, non-linear non -linear effects at the top. Um, and I've just got a couple of graphs showing this in the Great British class. So this, this is a question we asked, do you know a chief executive, a shop assistant, a factory worker, or an aristocrat? And we basically divided the responses according to how much you earn. If you look at the, you look at the yellow graph, the yellow line here for aristocrat, um, the, the important point here is that most people do not know an aristocrat. And in fact, 10% is obviously a massive over representation, not really 10% don't really know an aristocrat in Britain. But, but the point is, it doesn't shift much as you go up the income scale. You know, you can go up to £100,000, so in which case you're in the top 2% of earners. It doesn't raise that much. When you get over £200,000, you're in the top 0.5% of earners, it shoots up. Same is true for chief executives. Same is true for attending university. So, you know, it's often the case that you think about going to a top university as being um, a marker of your uh, success. Um, and, and, and in Britain, we have this notion, in the UK, we have this notion of going to a Russell Group University. Russell Group Universities are universities which are seen to be research intensive. We have about 20 of them. These, these are listed on this graph. But what we were able to do in the Great British Class Survey is find out, and I'm particularly interested in this, in the, um, the row for in the blue row, which indicates your chances of getting into the elite according to which, which specific university you went to. And the point here is that there is a big, big difference within the Russell Group between the University of Oxford and the University of York. These universities would, would see themselves as being on a, on a par, you know, research intensive universities. But in fact, you can see pretty easily there's a very clear um, top end effect. Oxford, LSE, Cambridge, King's College London, Imperial are the ones where you see a, a higher portion. It falls off quite dramatically. So just being a graduate is not going to get you, um, you know, high prospects of getting to if you don't go to a particular top end university. One of the interesting implications here, which is resonant for education, is that often working class people don't know this. And quite a lot of ethnographic studies showing that working class people think that just going to university in the UK will convey rewards. They don't understand that going to your local university does not convey the rewards of going to Oxford. Of course, the middle class kids know that. The parents tell them, you've got to go to Oxford if you can. So here's a classic example of how culture capital operates. Um, but I'm running out of time. I don't want to spend too much time. But here's, the, here's another example from my colleagues, Sam Friedman and Daniel Lawson, on um, social mobility into a series of elite professions. And they classify people in people who are moving into these jobs according to whether they were socially mobile from stable background, which means their parents were also in similar um, upper class jobs themselves. And the important contrast is here is between the percentage who are stable and the percentage who are long range mobile. And so within the various elite jobs, there's quite a bit of comparison. I'm, I'm really interested in the doctors and the lawyers because here a very high proportion of doctors and lawyers came from similar kinds of backgrounds. The point to make here is that you know this law school and medical school is highly credentialed. It's not as if these people are getting um, special you know resources um, to start a business or to, you know, they're not being given a business as an evidence. They are doing well through educational credentialized posters. This is exactly Bordier's point. Um, but again, you see this very distinct top end effects. So, what this means is that really, I think we're moving away from the world in which this conflict between industrialists and um, intellectuals is so intense. The intellectuals, if you like, have lost out. These days, the industrialists, the people with economic capital, hold all the cards. And then the intellectuals have to recognize that if they're going to have a cultural cachet. One of the interesting changes in the way cultural capital is organized compared to Pierre Bourdieu's times is that, 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 and this is a bit of paradoxical. And again, you know, when we think about Russian oligarchs, we often think about super yachts, you know, and, and when we think about Jeff Bezos flying to the moon and all that, we have this sense of them actually um, you know, conspicuously showing their 
um, money and their resources. But in fact, that is very untypical. Cultural capital these days is much more concerned with not showing off. Um, what Alan Ward and Yuka Gono call inconspicuous consumption. You don't want to draw attention to yourself, you're doing well. Because you feel a bit guilty, partly. Um, but also you don't want to kind of draw attention to your own privileges, but you might cause a bit of resentment. And that obviously as inequality increases, the, the value of not doing that, the value of not drawing attention to your privileges becomes more manifest. Very interesting ethnography by Rachel Sherman about Manhattanites. People live, you know, really affluent people living in New York. Really into being ethical, thinking about inequality, uh, you know, concerned about that privilege, that trying to downplay their privilege. And I have a I have a PhD student, Emma Taylor, who's doing this really interesting ethnography of, of one of Britain's top private schools. The kids there, they want to work in Africa. They want to think about, you know addressing climate change. They don't, they don't, they're not seeking to become super rich, at least on the face of it. This is the kind of paradox that Seamus Khan unpacks in his book, Privilege, which is one of the, about St. Paul's, one of the US's top private schools, where he explores the way in which actually, in this school where privilege is being performed in a very real way, it's not overtly talked about. And it's actually that ability to marshal a language of inclusivity and to have a discourse of inequality, which is very significant. Final slide, I'm gonna finish, I'm running out of time. So along with various colleagues, I mean, I, um, I, I have put together this notion of emerging cultural capital, and I'm particularly acknowledged Annick Prier, who's a Danish sociologist. We have, we have a paper here, which if you're interested, you can read, and it's also discussed in my book, which is actually that, Cultural capital is changing away from the forms that Pierre Bourdieu talks about, associated with humanities, models, kind of intellectual, you know, always head in the book, uh, thinking great intellectual things, it's becoming updated as we're moving to a world of more economic inequality. And I've just listed a series of ways in which uh, the younger, the kind of cultural capital of younger people is shifted towards the notion of being trendy and hip. Here, the cultural capital is about being able to mobilize different resources, being able to get your hands on important information. It's not being steeped in historical canon. Um, these days, cultural capital is much more physical and corporeal, how you display yourself. It's not about being a kind of shabby intellectual who wears jeans and looks just unkempt. You've got to, you've got to look the part. You've got to be engaged. It helps to be in the city. Cultural capital has moved to urban locations. The old notion, I mean, Bourdieu's notion of, of the Cantonese aesthetic is that notion of withdrawal, which goes back to the idea of the humanities as being based on the withdrawal from daily life. And again, the, Ox, the model of Oxford and Cambridge, if any of you know Oxford and Cambridge, the model on the monasteries, um, that, is, that is being shifted toward the urban universities. Uh, the embrace of the cosmopolitan, the in, in, emphasis not so much on the public sphere, and on engagement in public art galleries and public space, but capacity to consume digital space. Also a kind of implicit shift towards a more multicultural uh, perspective, which of course is not genuine, it's like, well, no, but it's the multicultural perspective is a perspective which can only be performed by people with that kind of privilege, but on the face of it, that's often advocated as being what's going on. So this has been a whistle stop tour, um, but hopefully it's given you a sense about why I think the notion of cultural capital is really important, but we need to recognize that the world has shifted. Um, and it's shifted towards a much more intense process of economic inequality within many nations. And as that's happened, cultural capital has had to align itself much more to the strategic and technical skills around which um, economic inequality is mobilized, but also is much more driven by elite institutions of various kinds, especially elite universities and elite schools. Um, and these places are often trumpeting meritocratic values as part of their ideology. But with that comes a huge baggage, which is that those, those, those meritocratic ideas produce a certain kind of credential elite who often behave, well, who tend to behave in um, Leakiest ways. And this is the point that 
many of you, particularly in the American audience, will know them the work of Michael Sandel, who wrote this book on the tyranny of merit, which is all about the irony is he's a Harvard professor, but it's all about how meritocracy and education expansion has led to high degree of elitism and complacency. And so it's really showing how the contradictions of cultural capital remain with us in this period of intense inequality. So thank you. I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. Um, if you have any questions um, for Mike, um, whether you're in, in this room or online, please save them until 8.30 for the Q&A. Um, and um, I want to introduce the, today's second speaker, Sharon. Um, Sharon Wolf is, uh, is an applied developmental psychologist and she's an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And she's also a research fellow at the Jacobs uh, Foundation. Uh, Dr. Wolf studies um, how children's family and educational environments shape their development and contribute to inequality. Um, she focuses on disadvantaged populations in the United States, but also in, in low-income and middle-income countries. Her research in, informs interventions and tests the effectiveness of theoretically informed policy solutions uh, designed to promote childhood development and learning and also reduce inequality. Dr. Wolf is um, one of the most promising young scholars in our field, and um, she has received many awards and recognitions. And what I really admire about her work is that she um, focuses on disadvantaged populations in low-income countries, and she works very intensively uh, with uh, local populations. She uh, has done work in Ghana, for instance, the Ivory Coast. Uh, she's worked with the Ministry of Education in Ghana to improve uh, the quality of the universal kindergarten educational system. And she has also worked with the Jacobs Foundation and the Ministry of Education in Ivory Coast um, to design parenting programs to help make parents more involved in children's education. Um, and in her talk, she will discuss how we can address early childhood inequality in low and middle income countries. Thank you for joining us, uh, Sharon, today. Thank you so much for having me. Let me share my screen. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the invitation, Eddie, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here virtually, and I wish I could be there with you all in person. Um, <clears throat> so I want to speak with you today um, about opportunities and challenges in designing and conducting actionable research to address young children's development around the globe. Um, as Eddie mentioned, my work um, is global in nature and, and very applied, and you'll hear um, about one particular example tonight. Um, but I wanted to start by just framing the talk. Um, in the last three decades, there have been global pledges, including the Convention of the Rights of the Child, the United Nations Millennium and Sustainable Development Goals, all aiming to ensure that all children can thrive and devoted to promoting children's academic learning and holistic development, and in large part through access to high quality education. But at least in developmental psychology, our science to date has really not addressed the needs of all children. There's an urgent need to ensure that our science informs efforts for young children globally and in sustainable and scalable ways given the scale of need, which I'll talk to you a little bit about tonight. So I, I hope I'll be able to convince you that it is possible to build a science for action that targets the development of young children globally um, and inspire you to consider this approach uh, in your work as well. So I wanna start with a few numbers. Um, the first is 90%, which is that nearly 90% of children and adolescents in the world live in a low or middle income country. So nearly all. Um, and a recent review of the three top developmental journals found that less than 7% of studies included samples of children in low and middle income countries and only 0.6% uh, included uh, children in sub-Saharan Africa. So this graph here is the projected population growth um, in European countries for 2050. And what you can see is on the y-axis is age of the population, on the um, x-axis is the percent of males and females in that population. And what you can see is what something that demographers talk about a lot, that the population is aging, right? By 2050, a larger proportion of the population will be between the ages of 50 to 80, and a smaller uh, proportion will be youth and young people. And I'm going to show you the same graph here for Sub-Saharan Africa. 
and you see a very different story, right? So mm -hmm. over the next century here, the largest increase in the world's population will take place in Africa. And by 2050, two in five of the world's children will be living on the African continent. So this fast rising population can bring major challenges, but also significant opportunities if we can really bring our science to help inform uh, and shape investments in this young population. So why do I want to talk to you tonight about early childhood? Um, early childhood is a foundational period in development. If we think about building a house, we can think of early childhood as the foundation from which the rest of the house is built. If it's not strong, the rest of the house will crumble, right? And we have this evidence from multiple fields showing a robust link between early life experiences and important later adult outcomes. So here's just a few highlights. From neuroscience, uh, we know that the brain develops rapidly in the first two years of life and is very sensitive to environmental inputs. So this graph that you see here on the right um, shows you the number of neural connections that form in the brain um, over, uh, over childhood. And you can see that the vast majority of connections across um, all these three different domains that are tracked here happen in the first year of life. Um, and after that, the, you know, connections continue to form, but at a much, much slower rate and a much less uh, smaller rate. We know from research in health um, that early uh, stress experiences and early activations of the stress response system shapes the development of the immune system and later chronic diseases. Um, and we know um, that using this evidence and other intervention studies, um, James Heckman and others from um, economics have plotted um, what return on investment we might get from investing in children at different developmental stages. Okay, so what you hear here, each, each color is a different developmental stage. Um, and what you see is the rate of return. So for every dollar that we invest in terms of the returns to society and improved benefits of later outcomes, which ultimately benefit societies, our investments go much further if we start in early childhood, okay? And then there's plenty of research from developmental psychology showing that early childhood is a period where really very linked to the neuroscience, a lot of critical foundational skills are developed, including language skills, cognition, executive function, and these all have consequences for children's later schooling and even adulthood experiences. So um, developmental science, which is the field which I come from, is a weird discipline. And what do I mean by that? Well, the vast majority of research has been conducted in Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic countries. These are weird countries, right? As you think back to my first slide, that represents about 10% of the children in the world. Um, and in psychology, they're really when we think about learning deficits globally, there are actually very limited efforts to try to address this and bring to bear the unique perspective of developmentalists um, have on how children learn, including the role of context in shaping learning, the role of social, emotional, and executive function skills. Um, and really, this has mostly been confined to, um, to these weird countries and contexts. When we think about early childhood specifically, research um, in low and middle income countries is extremely thin. It's been really dominated by public health, um, uh, the field which is really focused on malnutrition and survival and much less on learning and holistic development. This is slowly starting to change as there's more demand for evidence and interventions at local and global levels. On the advertisement for uh, the webpage for this conference tonight, there was reference to the sustainable development goals and one of the goals around reducing inequality. Um, well, one of the goals for quality education has a target to ensure that all girls and boys have access to at least one year of preschool, pre-primary education. And so there's been more effort to look in this period of early childhood when we think about educational opportunities um, and really try to bring to bear evidence on how we can do this. And I'll talk about that in the second part of my talk. So I just have a couple more graphs to help frame um, what, what I'll be diving into more specifically soon. So um, the Lancet uh, had a um, special issue on early childhood development a few years ago. And um, a, a group of researchers mapped the percent of children under five who are at risk of not reaching their developmental potential. 
How do they define that? Well, it's either children who are stunted, which means they're two standard deviations below the mean in terms of their height for age, or they're facing extreme poverty, okay? And you can see that in some, the darker color red indicate that more than 60% of children under five are facing one or two of these risks. And you can see that in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia, there's quite a concentration of children facing these risk factors. Another group of researchers uh, took this a step further and said, rather than looking at risk factors, let's actually look at outcomes. They used population level data of three and four year old children, and they looked to see which ones were not reaching key developmental milestones. Um, and what you see here again, darker colors indicate a higher proportion of children not reaching these milestones. And you can see a similar map to what we just saw before with the larger concentrations in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Really large numbers of children, if we think about that this is you know, a, a very, and by 2050, as I mentioned earlier, two in five children in the world will be living on the African continent. So there is growing hope that early childhood education can help children's prospects and might be one important pathway to address uh, learning deficits and developmental deficits. Um, early behavioral and social skills, those that children enter school with, have lifelong consequences. A really interesting study in North Carolina and the United States had kindergarten teachers rate children's social uh, competency skills. And then they used administrative data to see where those children were in their early adulthood. And they found links controlling for a whole set of demographics. They found links between what their kindergarten teachers um, said about their behavioral and social skills with their earnings, education levels, and criminal activities in adulthood. We know that early Literacy and math skills that children enter school with are the strongest predictor of their later learning outcomes. Um, and a recent meta-analysis showed that children who access quality early education are more likely to graduate from high school, less likely to repeat a grade. So, you know, I, I mentioned quality a few times here, and that's really key, right? A poor quality program implemented at scale isn't really going to help anyone. Um, and as programs start to think about scaling or countries start to think about expanding access, quality becomes really key. And it's really hard to ensure we can expand programs at a high quality. I'm going to show you a really busy graph now, and I don't want you to worry too much about it. What I want you to just focus on is that blue is the percent of kids in each country. Each line here is a, a low or middle income country. These are 35 countries that are part of the UNICEF Multiple Indicators Cluster Survey. And what you can see is blue is the percent of kids who have no access to early education and low stimulation at home. So really, they have poor learning environments, both at home and no access to one in school. Purple is kids who have access to both, okay? Good quality, or not quality, they're accessing ECE and they have high stimulation at home in terms of caregivers, talking to them, singing with them, teaching them different things. Um, but what you can see is there's a lot of variation, right? Kids' experiences really vary. Low and middle income countries have really different systems. And um, so my main takeaway here is that there's variation across countries. There's also a lot of variation within countries. So when we think about inequalities, we need to think both across and within countries. We see what we see in many places, which is that poor children have worse, have lower access to quality learning environments than wealthy children. These graphs are the percent of children who have access to high stimulation home environments. Okay, so with all this in mind, I want to take a dive now um, into a, a seven-year project to tell you a little bit about um, that has been a joint partnership um, between myself um, and the Ministry of Education in Ghana as well as our um, research partners, Innovations for Poverty Action Ghana, and a local teacher training center. Um, I am also have two collaborators who were part of this work from the start, Larry Aber at NYU and Jerry Bierman at, uh, at Penn. And this has now become the first and only impact evaluation of how um, accessing better quality early childhood education impacts children's educational experiences and trajectories long-term. We've been following these kids now for seven years. And I'll, I'm gonna give you a high level summary of what we found and also some of the promises, but also pitfalls that we've come across when we think about engaging uh, teachers and parents. 
So I'll tell you a teeny bit about Ghana before we jump into the study. Um, so uh, early childhood participation is on the rise globally, um, but there's still really big uh, differences based on global regions. So in sub-Saharan Africa, as a region, children have some of the lowest rates of access, one in five children accessing some sort of early education. But Ghana is actually considered a leader, not just in sub-Saharan Africa, actually globally in their investments in early childhood education, with about three out of four children accessing preschool. And that's because in 2004, the country developed the National Early Childhood Care and Policy Program. And they developed as part of that a curriculum for pre-primary school that they call kindergarten or KG. And they had a very interesting vision for kindergarten. It was really based in developmental um, science in terms of how young children learn best. And uh, the curriculum really focused on play-based activity-centered learning, child-centered classrooms, which is actually very different than what a typical primary school classroom looks like. And we'll come back to that in a, in a few slides. Um, and in 2007, they actually made this uh, part of their education policy. They expanded two years of pre-primary education as part of their free compulsor compulsory basic education system. In 2012, the Ghana Education Service did a survey of the sector. It was five years after they'd expanded access. And they kind of they concluded that the 2004 curriculum was sound, that they felt it was appropriate. Um, they called it this kindergarten specific pedagogy um, uh, was a good one, but that nobody was using it. Teachers weren't trained in it, and really classrooms did not look at all like what the vision was for um, based on the curriculum. So their top priority was to train 27,000 untrained teachers in this pedagogy. Um, and also another conclusion of the report was that generally uh, parent engagement is quite low in Ghana. Um, and so to use kindergarten as a platform uh, to try to increase parent engagement and also raise their awareness of this pedagogy. So on the next slide, I'm actually going to play you an audio clip. And this comes from a, a podcast that covered this study. And it's just to give you a very brief sense of what did the what do the classrooms kind of typically look like and what were we hoping to change okay so you'll hear the reporter you'll hear my voice and you'll also hear the director of basic education in ghana um, margaret okai okay so this is a picture of a classroom in ghana a pre-primary classroom and, and uh hopefully you can hear this you'll let me know if you can't you walk into one of these classrooms, you find two-year-olds sitting at desks in rows. It's a very serious environment. There's no toys, no windows to look through. And the teacher holds up picture cards. Shoes! 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 These preschools have basically just become extensions of primary schools. A lot of rote memorization. All I'm saying, shoes! 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 We called up the official in charge of Ghana's elementary schools, Margaret Okai. She says most preschool teachers in Ghana, they don't have any training. Sometimes when you enter their classroom, you realize that they are not able to engage the children. They fall back on how they learned in school, with lectures, memorization. And talking, talking, talking. All I'm saying is nose. 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 Show me your nose. Now, this class of two-year-olds is on to Roman numerals. I stand for one. I, I stand for two. Okay. All right, so um, that just gives you a very little sense of, um, you know, what a typical classroom looks like, a lot of teacher-directed instruction, a lot of rote memorization. Um, you saw that the teacher in that picture was holding a little um, cane, a lot of um, using kind of this reactive behavior management, and this was what the government was really hoping to try to change. Um, it was very counter to the kindergarten curriculum. So this is where um, we came in to partner with them, um, as well as a local teacher training center, and, and as I mentioned, Innovations for Poverty Action. And our goal was to develop and test a nationally scalable model for teachers and parents. Um, and I say nationally scalable on purpose. We had this very much in mind from the start. Um, we did not want to design a program that cost uh, an exorbitant amount of money, required a, a lot of resources, and could actually never be scaled up. And so from the start, we um, designed all of our programs, all of our trainers uh, were were part of the existing systems and structures in terms of the national and district education offices. So the goal is to 
and really try to test a scalable program, right? That could be um, scaled up if it were to be successful. And there were two main parts. There was a teacher training and coaching program, which was really the core. Um, and then there was this additional test of a parental awareness intervention. The teacher training was led by the National Nursery Teacher Training Center trainers. These are actually part of the Ministry of Education. It's if you want to get a certificate in Ghana in early education, that's really the place to go. And it was a it was a brief training followed by refresher trainings and teachers had in classroom monitoring and coaching by the district education coordinators that was already part of their job. They were just um, not really doing it for different reasons. So we worked with the district education offices to kind of get this, um, this component of their staff um, working with us on the program. And then a second intervention was this parental awareness program. It was implemented through school parent teacher association meetings, because again, we wanted a scalable platform for it. It was implemented from the same district education officers. And we worked with a local media company to develop these videos focused on three themes. The first was how young children learn and the, the importance of play-based learning. The second was on parents' role in child, children's learning. And then the third was on encouraging parent and teacher communication. So we evaluated this with a, what's called a school randomized trial, where we worked in 240 schools and schools were randomized to a control group, to a teacher train, this teacher training and coaching program, or that same program plus that parental awareness intervention. Okay, this was done in 2015. As I mentioned, we have been continuing to follow the children ever since. And ultimately the goal was to support children's school readiness. And we thought that this would happen through two primary pathways. One is through really changing the quality of the classroom and teacher-child interactions. And the other was through changing professional well-being. There were really high levels of turnover in the pre-primary sector, really high levels of burnout, and that this might be a very important pathway that would affect teacher-child interactions. So we tested these kind of two versions of the program, the teacher training alone and the teacher training plus the parental awareness. I'm gonna show you the project timeline. You don't need to worry about it. Just so you get a sense though of kind of what's been happening and how many follow-ups we've been doing over the past seven years. And then I'm gonna give you a high level summary of what we found in the first four years of the program and then tell you some of our newer findings um, during the pandemic. And I wanna to talk to you a bit also at the end about this parent engagement intervention, as you're gonna see, it did not work as we had hypothesized. Okay, so the first, um, the first thing I wanna tell you about is what we found when it came to um, changing the classroom context. So what you see here are effect sizes. These come from our um, impact estimate models, and they give you a sense of uh, relative to the control group, how did classrooms change? The green bar is the, the classrooms from the teacher training condition. The um, blue bar is the classrooms from the teacher training plus parental awareness schools. And what you see is both treatments increased activity-based learning, both treatments increased emotional support and positive behavior management. And the teacher training program really um, shifted how teachers were supporting students' expression. This is really putting students at the center of the classroom um, and also really helping children develop critical thinking and problem solving skills. Very different than the clip you heard that was very focused on rote memorization, right? What was really a first hint that something didn't go as expected in the parental awareness condition is that teachers where parents were engaged did not make those changes to support student expression and really turn the classroom to be more um, focused on developing children's critical thinking. Um, when we look at teachers' professional well-being, we see that both programs, uh, in terms of statistically significant effects, reduced burnout. Here is something we wanna see, negative impacts, right? Um, and both programs reduce teacher turnover. So in the control schools, 41% of teachers were gone by the time we came back for our end line assessments at the end of the school year. This gives you a sense of how much turnover there is. And that was reduced significantly um, if teachers received this training. So did these ultimately trickle down on impacts on children? Well, you saw that the parental awareness intervention counteracted some of those positive gains. When we looked at kids, there were no impacts on children who were part of this teacher training plus parental awareness group. They looked like the control group. So I'm going to show you impacts for the kids who were just in the teacher training program. 
And what we see in the first year of the intervention is these are again effect sizes, positive impacts on their literacy numeracy skills and their social and emotional development. A year later, they were in new classrooms with new teachers, and we saw some persistent effects on social, emotional, and executive function skills. We think that um, you know, because classrooms were so academically focused that it's possible the control group kids caught up on the academic stuff, but because primary schools are not focusing on social and emotional and executive function skills, children were able to continue to, to benefit from that um, improved quality a year earlier. And then two years later, we looked at children again, and we found sustained impacts here on um, self-regulation, behavior regulation, and executive functioning. And actually, again, we see some statistically significant improvements in, in literacy compared to the control. Now, we, we went, we had planned to go again in March 2020. We had just finished tracking about 3,000 kids in their schools, and then the pandemic hit. So we shifted gears and, and moved to phone surveys uh, later in 2020. And we looked to see what children's educational experiences were during the pandemic when schools were closed. And what we find here is that when we ask both children and caregivers independently to report on the types of remote learning children were engaged in, this is different, a whole different set of activities we asked about, children who were in this teacher training arm are, can, are doing actually more remote learning activities compared to the control group. So there's something about having access to high quality pre-primary education that left kids more engaged in education during the pandemic. When we look at the teacher training program plus the parent awareness, there are no, no significant differences. We also saw some evidence that the programs were shaping time use. This is five years after kids have had the, um, were in pre-primary school. So kids in the teacher training were reporting about a half an hour more on a typical weekday on studying. Um, and kids actually in the, in the parent intervention and teacher training group were doing more leisure and household chores. So the, the program actually was continuing to shape children's home environments just in different ways when parents were engaged. So we did some follow-up interviews after the intervention when we saw that the parenting intervention did not work as we had um, expected. And what I just want to tell you a couple of the key takeaways that I think they're really relevant when we think about inequality within countries and parent engagement. So the first was that uh, parents really valued preschool education. They saw it as foundational to the academic and social development of their children but they were very focused on the academics and they really, in their mind, classrooms looked like the video that you saw or the clip you heard earlier. And when they were seeing that schools were doing something different, they actually were concerned that that was going to undermine their child's learning. Um, they also saw their primary responsibilities related to making sure kids get to school, that their school fees are paid, that they had their uniforms, but not to support learning at home. They felt that's why they send their kids to school, right? That's the teacher's job. Teachers talked about um, that parents pushed back on the intervention activities in these meetings and that they felt very frustrated when they did try to engage parents, that parents just did not want to be involved in that level in their child's um, schooling experience. They, and many of the parents in our sample had had no schooling experience themselves. So in terms of their self-efficacy to be um, create a home learning environment, they didn't feel that they had it. Um, when we looked at some of the quantitative data here, what you see is the control group compared just to those children in the teacher training plus parental awareness intervention. We see that actually most of these counteracting impacts are driven by children in households where the male head is not literate. So less, you know, less school experience, which points to similar evidence from the qual qualitative data that these parents didn't feel it was their role and didn't feel that they had really the, the skills to be able to kind of do what the intervention was asking them to do. So um, I just want to wrap up with three takeaway points that I, I hope you're taking away from this. The first is that there is an urgent need to invest more in understanding the opportunities and challenges that children um, are experiencing in low and middle income countries and what opportunities we have to promote resilience and to really build in this perspective on inequality within um, each country that we look at. 
Um, I hope you're taking away that there is a potential for scalable solutions to improve quality early childhood education and that this can really change educational trajectories of children. We're actually going to be following the children for an additional five years with a grant we just got. So we're really excited to see as children are entering now adolescence and early adulthood um, if there are lasting um, Imp uh, lasting changes from this one year of pre-primary uh, improved quality. Um, we also did a cost analysis. As I said, we were really thinking about scalability from the start. And our estimates is this program cost about $10 per child, which is really not so much, right? Um, and then the last thing I, I hope you'll take away is that there is a potential of supporting parents, but changing parental beliefs and inputs is really not straightforward. Um, and if we're gonna really think about reducing inequality, um, there's really a need to focus on parents with low schooling experiences and specifically design for them and their children or else programs might actually increase inequality as the more resourced families can take advantage of them and the less resourced families um, might not. Um, so I, uh, I'll stop there. I think I'm just about at my time and thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you so much, Sharon. That was really exciting. Looking forward to the to the discussion at 8:30. Um, so I want to introduce the third speaker of today, uh, final speaker, David uh, Jaeger. Uh, David is a developmental psychologist and an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and he's also a research fellow at the Jacobs Foundation. Um, David's work uh, sits at the intersection of developmental, social, personality, and educational psychology. And he's really interested in the sociocognitive processes that are involved in adolescent development. And he's well known, of course, for his work on growth mindset um, research. He has received many awards and recognitions, including the SSCD Early Career, uh, Early Career Research Contribution Award, as well as the APA Boyd McCandles Award. Um, and what I really admire about his work is that he's not only a person who does very precise theoretical work, uh, but also conducts really impressive large-scale uh, randomized controlled trials in, in, in large samples uh, in the United States. Um, David, I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Uh, he will talk about what he has learned about um, conducting field experiments to reduce uh, inequality in education. Thank you, David. Fabulous. It's uh, great to see everyone. Um, thank you for including me. Um, and uh, are you able to see my screen? Does it look good? Yes. Great. Um, so I'm a developmental psychologist, as was mentioned. I'm, I'm also a former teacher. And so I come to this work thinking very carefully about the power of psychological theory to unlock people's potential but also of the realities of getting really anything to work in school contexts and how hard that is. So the particular angle that I take on inequality in human capital is through the education system, and in particular through the ways in which young people navigate transitions in that education system. In particular, the idea that when people successfully transition from, for instance, elementary or primary school to secondary school, from secondary to post-secondary, from post-secondary to career, that there's slippage where we lose talented and motivated young people and don't fully include them in the workforce in the future. So we want to know, is it possible to be attuned to that context, but also find ways of taking advantage of it uh, through psychological intervention? So we've had some exciting results, and some are brand new that you're going to see today, and I'm excited to have a dialogue with you about them. So here's an overview. We're going to ask um, about growth mindset in particular, uh, whether they can promote academic achievement and equity under some conditions. Um, can teachers promote growth mindset classroom cultures in a way that promotes equity? And is there a role for growth mindset on a more global level? So th this research really is rooted in a developmental perspective on young people. You know, uh, we want to know why is it that some students, so 15-year-olds in ninth grade, for example, embrace challenges and cope well with setbacks while others don't. This is a real puzzle because we know that babies are very curious and are very resilient learners. You don't see babies say, oh, I'll just learn later, 
right? You see, you see babies who embrace challenge, who, who, who master complex grammar and syntax uh, two years into life. And yet by the time our young people are uh, in high school or, or middle school, we see this disaffection, this disengagement that um, is even more rampant now that kids are coming out of an exhausting pandemic. We think that uh, there are many reasons why people lose this natural love of learning, but one thing that can play a role is people's mindsets or their beliefs about their potential or other characteristics. My collaborator, Carol Dweck, has characterized mindsets along a continuum from more of a fixed mindset to more of a growth mindset. Fixed mindset is the idea that something like intelligence is a stable trait that can't be changed. A growth mindset is the idea that ability or intelligence is a potential that can be developed and cultivated. And uh, research has um, described these mindsets as existing along a continuum. It's not like someone is all or nothing. You're not always a fixed mindset person or always a growth mindset person. Everyone has a little bit of both. It's also domain specific. So you might have a mindset about intelligence being fixed, but you might think personality can grow. You might think Math ability is fixed, so maybe you think creativity can be developed. And in general, the closer you measure a mindset to the domain you're studying, the stronger results you tend to get. These different mindsets set up different meaning systems. So now we're going to think from a kind of social psychological perspective. What is it like to be a young person confronting challenging work, maybe a new physics problem, maybe you're learning calculus, maybe you're analyzing a poem, right? What is it like to be that young person and have a fixed mindset in which intelligence can never change? What research has identified is a different set of goals, effort beliefs, and responses to setbacks. In a fixed mindset, young people have told us their goals are to look smart at all costs, or at a minimum to avoid looking dumb as much as possible. What about effort? In a fixed mindset, effort is negative. It's something that reveals your lack of ability. You have to be one of those people who have to try hard, right? Um, and setbacks are things that derail students in more of a fixed mindset. In a growth mindset, though, students have told us that their goal is to grow their ability, to develop it not necessarily to protect reputation for having high ability. Effort in a growth mindset is seen as the means through which people can grow their abilities rather than a sign that you lack ability. And we found that when young people are confronted with new hard challenges in a growth mindset, they have tended to be more resilient. For example, um, being willing to ask for help when they're stuck visiting an instructor to ask for greater clarification, changing their strategies, and so on. So just, just to give you a sense of these different meaning systems, these different subjective psychological worlds that the mindsets can create. Um, what does this look like in the brain? In a beautiful study that Jason Mosier did, um, he took, uh, uh, took students into the lab one by one and measured their event-related potentials in their, uh, in their brains. Um, uh, under the scalp when they had made a mistake, but before they were uh, asked a second time to correct that mistake. What they showed is that with among people who had reported more of a fixed mindset, there were event-related potentials consistent with less thinking, less problem solving, um, less revisiting your, your problems and your errors. It's like they were saying, get me out of here. I don't want to confront this mistake presumably because it because mistakes reveal a lack of potential. In a growth mindset, though, you see on the right, there is greater activation in regions related to planning and revising strategies. It's like, it, it, it's like they were trying to learn from errors, not avoid them. Um, how does growth mindset relate to achievement? Uh, the PISA survey recently, um, the most recently released PISA survey measured growth mindset. They administered our, our items to um, 79 OECD nations. And this is a very simple plot from Andreas Schleicher, who's the head of the PISA. 
uh, linking a country's level of growth mindset. So the percent of students who uh, disagree that intelligence is fixed, that's the x-axis. And the y-axis is the average reading score on the PISA. And what they found was this fascinating between country correlation. And this is not causal. I'll show you interventions in a moment, but it's fascinating that countries with higher levels of achievement tended to have higher levels of growth mindset. And furthermore, if you look on the left, there none of the uh, lowest achieving um, uh, uh, countries also had high growth mindset. Right? And there are very few high achieving countries that did not have moderate to high levels of growth mindset. Now, this is a little foreshadowing, but you might say, well, hmm, this is interesting. You've got Hong Kong here. It seems like they're low on mindset, but they're also high on achievement test scores. Well, there's a kind of fascinating puzzle where in countries where young people are already doing 70 or 80 hours of school per week because of the strong social pressures for formal education, uh, growth mindset can't do that much more. It's not like 15 year olds can ask for even more work if all of the hours of the day are spent learning. But you do find in these countries that mindset is strongly related to mental health. So in these places, growth mindset is related to less of a fear of failure and a fear of disappointing parents and others uh, when you, if you might fail. Uh, what's fascinating too is that these between country results were consistent within the country. Um, furthermore, getting to the inequity uh, point, um, the person level correlations between mindset and test scores were generally stronger for groups that are underrepresented in the more elite levels of education. So uh, lower socioeconomic status individuals, uh, immigrant backgrounds, girls, especially in math, all showed stronger correlations between mindset and outcomes in the PISA survey. Again, correlations, not causation, but suggesting this is a general phenomenon that has some implications around the world. And I was just on a panel with Andreas Schleicher from the PISA yesterday, and he said that the biggest priority at the PISA currently in the OECD is to figure out how the education systems can have a belief in growth and inclusion in the fabric of educational systems. Not as something in the head of the kid, but as something, a core assumption of educational systems globally. That's what, that's what he, um, their priority is. Now, but can mindsets be changed? There were some initial interventions that were interesting. Uh, they were smaller scale. They were multi-session. They required in-person training in mindsets. But they're not scalable. So could we think of an intervention that could plausibly be scaled to an entire nation or multiple nations? And what would that look like? <clears throat> we had a kind of crazy idea a few years ago. Um, the idea was to distill a growth mindset message into something very short. So, so two sessions totaling um, under 50 minutes, send out the growth mindset over the internet. So students would go to computer labs and complete our materials to do it in a nationally representative sample of ninth graders in the US and allow students to self-administer it which is important because that means you don't need to train anyone at the schools to administer the intervention. So then it makes it uh, really cost effective. So uh, we calculate it's about five cents per kid. And if you did that, could you possibly impact grades and advanced math courses the next year? So <clears throat> I wanna emphasize that a growth mindset intervention is not like a magic bullet that we can um, uh, assume uh, we just say have a growth mindset and then people will uh, learn more and do well. Uh, instead, we frame the growth mindset intervention as a request for help from young people. We say to them, we're adults, we're researchers. We don't know what it's like to be a 15 year old struggling in school. We need your input to make these materials better and to resonate with future students. So that takes students out of being defensive right away. Then we teach them brain science. This is some very basic insights. Uh, we start with a metaphor, the idea that the brain is like a muscle. 
just like muscles get stronger the more you exercise them, um, the uh, the brain gets stronger and, and grows uh, more denser or more effective synapses and more uh, efficient networks in the brain whenever you learn. Okay. And we have people visualize their brains growing stronger networks while they're struggling on important content. And we don't just tell them this information, we also have them read it from peers who say, I tried out these mindset ideas in my class, here's how they helped me, here's how I cared about it and used it. And so then after teenagers read this content, then we ask them to contribute their own ideas through writing exercises. We say, we need your help to mentor struggling students in the future. Could you write about how building a stronger brain in high school can help those future students achieve their goals in life? Um, to test this, we recruited a nationally representative sample. So there are 12,000 public high schools in the US. We randomly selected 76 and we flew to them and we sent uh, teams there to get to know the teachers but then the teachers were able to administer the treatment in this random sample. Everyone was kept blind to the study hypotheses, so they thought it was just a survey about transitioning to high school. No, we never told anyone about growth mindset or trained teachers in any way on growth mindset. Um, furthermore, it's a within school random assignment. So if there are a thousand ninth graders, 500 got the treatment, 500 got a very similar control group, that taught them cognitive science and in, in, uh, study strategies um, and how the brain can remember information. So to the kids, it looked like interesting information that was the same, but in fact, half of the kids got the growth mindset and half didn't. What did we find? In a paper we published in Nature a couple years ago, in a pre-registered analysis, we found that the growth mindset intervention improved grade point average at the end of ninth grade. So this is about eight months later, among lower achieving students, which is important because students who already have straight A's can't possibly get higher grades. We also found greater enrollment in advanced math courses. So students who got the treatment said, I would like to take the harder math track, not the easier math track. And we know that the lockstep sequence of math courses is like a train that takes you to upward mobility or not in our highly technical current workforce. Students who do not pass ninth grade with an adequate understanding and an appetite for mathematics are very unlikely to have a meaningful contribution in the way we've decided to structure our highly advanced uh, economy. And what we find is that we keep more students on the advanced math train uh, the year after the study from the short intervention. We recently revisited the schools four years later and got the high school transcripts for all of the students in our national study. What did we find? What we found is overall, there was an increase in graduation from high school ready for college of 1.7 percentage points. And that effect was larger for black indigenous students of color, which was about 45, 43% of our sample. We don't see benefits for white students overall, but there are benefits for white students who were previously lower achieving, but in supportive schools, okay? So this is interesting. This has never been, this kind of finding has never appeared before. Just to put these effect sizes in, in um, context, so very expensive interventions like early college high school that brings college professors into high schools so that students can take advanced courses that cost about $12,000 per student. Uh, they got about a one or two percentage point in improvement on this outcome four years later. So here we have something that's five cents per student and having these striking effects. But here's where it's complicated. The treatment does not have the same effects everywhere. In fact, this is where we get to the mindset by context idea. For an intervention effect to last, you need both the high quality seed, so a well-crafted mindset intervention, and a conducive soil in which that seed can grow. Contextual affordances that are congruent with that mindset. So what did we find in our study? What we found is that if the teachers had a fixed mindset, the treatment didn't improve grades at the end of the year, 
But if the teacher espoused more of a growth mindset, it did improve grades at the end of ninth grade. All right. So this is consistent with our mindset by context hypothesis. Furthermore, if you look in back in the PISA data, students who report a growth mindset overall get higher test scores, but that's especially true if they also had teachers who provided feedback, helped all students learn, and adapted their instruction. So that's created a new set of goals for us, what we call our first Mount Everest, Mount Everest, which is creating growth mindset school cultures. And we feel like that as interesting as the growth mindset idea has been, it has not fulfilled its potential. And the reason why is because we have not yet figured out how to create cultures that instill and sustain the growth mindset. And so we had a vision a couple of years ago to learn how to reduce fixed mindset teaching practices, identify high leverage growth mindset practices, and then try to architect growth mindset cultures that truly support students' mindsets. What we decided to do was to launch a pilot project and try to solve a particular problem of practice, and by doing so, learn about the broader space of growth mindset culture creation. So over the last year, we ran a randomized trial in 20 Texas school districts with 54 teachers and over 3,000 students. We call it the Texas Mindset Initiative. It takes a while to explain, so it could also be TMI, as in too much information, um, but we affectionately call it TexMI for short. Um, why Algebra 1? Well, as I mentioned, Algebra 1 is a dividing line for inclusion in our culture, in our global economy. Furthermore, it is a course that um, many students dislike and that they, have, they face fixed mindset stereotypes. They know that the students who are fastest at math are tend to be called the smartest. And so we think Algebra 1 is a place where students might really need a growth mindset. And why is this hard? Can't you just give the student treatment to teachers and call it a day? No, you can't. The, the, the benefits of a growth mindset to a student are obvious. They don't have to feel dumb anymore. But the benefits to a teacher are not obvious. If all of a sudden all your students ask for more work and want to revise and resubmit their work and stay after class and ask you a million questions, that feels like we're creating more work for teachers. So it's not at all necessary. We can't assume that it's welcome news to teachers to all of a sudden have to have a growth mindset culture, especially not in a year when students are just coming back to school. We had two variants, Delta and Omicron. There were new laws passed about uh, how teachers did high dosage tutoring. It was a mess. And like the teaching profession it was a bloodbath this year. People are leaving in droves. So it was a kind of crazy year to do this study. And yet, we felt like it was an important time to do it. So we had some challenges. How do you make the program attractive and not just another thing on their list of things that they're not doing yet? How do you know which practices to actually recommend? It's not like you teachers can just put up a growth mindset poster and say, now everyone has a growth mindset. What does it mean to authentically create a growth mindset culture? And then the big question, do students perceive the changed culture and respond to challenges and difficulty differently. So um, one of the things we did was to conduct what's called a bright spots analysis. So we identified teachers in Texas who beat the odds and we brought them into our design team and we spent a year co-developing practices with them and co-developing an argument for why teachers should adopt the growth mindset practices. And I'm happy to answer more about that in the Q&A, but we learned so much. And it's we're glad we did this because we researchers in our ivory towers could never have anticipated the variability in how people try to implement growth mindset. What did we find in our pilot? What we found is that a virtual web-based fellowship for teachers done over Zoom, three days in the summer, and then one hour per month during the year, during this most recent year, changed teachers' beliefs, which is great, but that's what we taught them. But more importantly, changed students' perceptions of the culture and even reduced stress and anxiety. Students were less likely to say, I feel overwhelmed, I feel anxious in math, I can't handle it. When we say it improved the culture, what do we mean? I mean, we, students answered questions in the affirmative like this. 
My teacher believes everyone in my class can be very good at this subject. My math teacher respects all students, even the ones who are struggling with the work. Students in my math class feel comfortable raising their hand to ask a question when they are confused. Isn't that the kind of math class we all wanna be in? Isn't that the kind of class we want for our young people? And why should only the most advantaged kids have that kind of math class? So we're really excited that these effects were especially clear for students from underrepresented groups. And now we're, we're going to over a thousand teachers over the next few years. What did I mean by it's better effects for um, disadvantaged students? Our students of color increased their perceptions of the mindset culture um, slightly more, but the most important part is there are no more disparities in whether teachers make students feel like they're not good enough, they're not smart enough, and they can't do it. And in our global work, we know that many students experiencing poverty are looked down on by teachers and thought of as not smart enough to do well. And we find that this teacher-focused intervention can eliminate some of those disparities. And this gets us excited. What if the same program inspired students to want to learn math, created inclusion in math, improved stress and well-being, and even retained more teachers in the profession? Could teachers, instead of being a source of stress, be a resource for helping young people overcome stress? And so this led us to revisit what the right Mount Everest was. We think there needs to be a new model for education research. Student programs, yes, but there should also be teacher programs. We need researcher practitioner partnerships. So it's not those of us from the outside recommending exactly what should happen, but we're co-developing treatment um, exercises. Infrastructure to continue testing. We don't think we should be in a world where we think we have the perfect intervention and then freeze it and then run one trial and then wait five years and see what happens. We did that study, it was great, but that's not enough. That was five years in one t-test in one nature paper. We should be testing a hundred ideas a year, not one. So we need to think, we think we should move um, to an R&D infrastructure model, not a single hypothesis test model, and then have a clear focus on inclusion and mental health. To close, I wanna just say that we're now working with the OECD and the PISA to think about context in a more global way. How can we be informed by those PISA results and find interesting pockets of mindset innovation and study them? Estonia, for example, has a really high growth mindset and a really high academic achievement and really good well being. What are they doing? I want to find out. So let's not just have individual teacher bright spots, let's think about global bright spots and learn from them and see how we can apply these ideas uh, at a more global level to promote equity. So thank you so much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you, David. Um, I think we will now go to the Q&A and discussion. So if you have a question, please come up to the microphone and if you're on online, please um, turn on your camera and raise your hand using the raise hand uh, button. Can we show the people who are online also on the screen so that we can see who raises their hand. Ah, okay, so, okay, okay, let's, um, so if you're online and you wanna ask a question, please turn on your camera and, and raise your hand um, so that we can see you. Okay, let me ask the first question in this case. Um, so Sharon, uh, I was really inspired uh, by your work and um, uh, I was wondering, like of course many of these parenting interventions and, and educational interventions have been developed uh, in, in, um, in high income Western countries. And um, people who develop these interventions often claim that they address universal developmental mechanisms. Um, but of course I think what your work shows is that you cannot easily tra transfer an intervention to an entirely different context and, and assume that it works. What are your thoughts on making uh, parenting interventions more scalable and more easily transferable across uh, cultures and countries? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I don't, I don't think it's simple. Um, in, you know, in the project that I presented today um, in Ghana, this was actually not, this was a program that was developed within Ghana. We worked with local early childhood experts and a local media company. Um, of course, the content came from perhaps more of a Western notion of what parent engagement might look like in early childhood education, but it was really adapted to meet um, the realities of parents' lives, which in this case, parents actually didn't see their kids very much during the week. They worked till very late at night. It was often siblings or aunts who would actually take kids to and from school. Um, and so we tried to really adapt the messages and um, discussions to fit into the life's the, the realities of, of families' lives. Um, I think, but where where we hit a, hit a stumbling block was that the, the basic premise of what parents' roles should be uh, was different, fundamentally different, right? And we actually saw that in another project in, um, we did some work in rural Ghana and Northern Ghana in the aftermath of the pandemic using SMS nudges to try to encourage caregivers to send their children back to school once schools reopen and to engage more fully um, in children's schooling and, and uh, broad, broader social emotional lives. And there we saw um, another challenge where we actually saw the intervention increased inequality. So parents who had some level of schooling, and it was even just a couple of years, uh, were more likely as a result of this intervention to send their kids back to school, especially their girls, older girls, to increase their engagement at home, to ask about homework, um, you know, read to their kids, things like that, or, or encourage their kids to read. Actually, most of the parents were not literate in this program. And those who had no schooling experiences that actually reduced, it, it, we saw this in the quantitative data, reduced their self-efficacy and reduced the engagement they were doing at home with their kids. It increased their aspirations. They thought their kids would go further in school. Um, and that was another program where we spent a lot of time adapting it. We worked with local NGOs. We worked with the, the Ministry of Education. We adapted the, the content to really fit kind of parables and highlight stories from the local communities of children who had been successful. Um, so I think... Um, the kind of work we're doing now is actually really different in response to this. Uh, we're now doing a few different studies where we're doing community-based participatory research with parents and really starting and letting them tell us, um, you know, where they want help, where do they feel they're doing well, where are they, um, where where would they want a hand, where would they not want a hand, and trying to really start from that premise and what we design. So that, that actually makes it harder to do culturally, uh, cross-cultural and kind of universal programming. But I think there are ways to have kind of universal principles and ways to adapt. But I think we'll know more after we do a lot more of this just listening. Um, and we're also doing a lot more listening and talking to kids themselves. I think we actually don't do that so well in developmental psychology. Um, and so we're, we're gonna um, talk, we're, we're doing some focus groups with children and adolescents to also see where they would want some support around the relationships with their parents. So I hope we'll know more in the, in the coming six months, but I, I actually am uh, currently thinking that trying to do things universally uh, at a large scale, um, you know, we might have to think of much smaller changes rather than really ultimately, like really changing parents' underlying beliefs. Uh, that I think is going to require much more intensive and uh, locally grounded efforts. Thank you, Sharon. Um, there's one question from the audience online. Forrest, if you want to ask your question. And I'm working on yeah project trying to, to decrease uh, yeah barriers for first gener perspective first generation university students. And I'm curious, are there reflections that you have about slippage and transitions related to this growth mindset work? Yeah. So so that our national study. Uh, is tracking students through college through the National Student Clearinghouse. So it's a nice database because you can submit their names every semester and figure out what's happening. So we have the only nationally representative study that has beliefs and other things about kids from ninth grade who then are in college before and after the pandemic because they were freshmen before the pandemic and now they're juniors in college. And so what I mean by slippage, what I mean is 
kids who pass ninth grade, they pass all their core classes, they had an aspiration to go to college, and maybe even graduated high school. And the you know already there was melt to get to college before the pandemic, but the pandemic differentially sorted students into um, leaving. So the so pandemic has magnified disparities. And I know we know that, but to see that really starkly with our own administrative data, with representative samples is amazing. So the, the proportion of, of students of color who left college but were college qualified was during the pandemic was twice as high compared to the white percentage of white students in the US. So like, I, I don't think a psychological solution is the answer to each of those. They're each multifaceted, but I tend to think of those junctures as good points for intervention and for kind of problem solving. Um, at the same time, uh, the, the kids who finished our treatment and then got into advanced math uh, in 10th grade, or at least stayed in, on the advanced math track, did better in college over time. They had a different set of peer groups uh, and then in more credentials. So, um, but I'd be curious to hear what in particular would be most helpful or interesting to you on this topic, because we do have, we have lots of data on it and be happy to share that with you. Or have you left the mic, in which case I'll retract my question. Well, Forrest, I don't think he's able to unmute himself. Could you help Forrest unmuting himself? Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, the button came up. And, yeah, I almost missed it. Thanks. Um, yeah, David, it's a, it's a good question. It's for me specifically, I'm curious whether growth mindset uh, teaching experiences are something that that we should involve in our in our programming for these prospective uh first generation university students that are still in high school or whether that's really something better off in, in those the high schools that they're in um and and i guess a corollary or a second question is you know what yeah i guess you don't know all the answers yet but um, how much the growth mindset helps them tackle new situations, new environments uh, yeah. as they progress. Okay, great. So let me just share them. Um, this is these are these are this is a graph of percent of students who are still post secondary throughout COVID nineteen. So from fall twenty nineteen to May twenty twenty one, by mindsets they are self reported in ninth grade. This is we I mean, had growth mindset, purpose mindset, and belonging. And it kind of didn't matter which one, but they're, they're kind of interchangeable assets. The more productive mindset students reported in ninth grade, the more likely they were to be still in college. And it's a difference of 45% versus 20%, right? And this is, these are six survey items in ninth grade. So that suggests there is something about kids' mindsets. At the same time, I don't think it's necessarily purely psychological. I think it's that when you have a kind of desire for challenge, you get into institutional gateways and it's the power of those institutions that structure access that in turn help you forward. So it's not clear to me that training on these mindsets necessarily is the only or even best way to go about it. It might be that you need to think about who are the gatekeepers in the new institution that are conveying the wrong mindset. So who are the ins gateway instructors in large introductory courses who are conveying to students look to your left, look to your right, and half of you like aren't smart enough to be here. So I kind of really believe in like powerful gatekeepers who structure access to institutional opportunities as a key leverage point for uh, mindset work in the future. Well, of course, acknowledging that a person's own belief in themselves could be an asset as well. Thank you, David. Um, I have two questions from people here in the audience. Um, Herman, you have a question from Mike. Yes, um, uh, these were three fantastic uh, talks, actually. So, um, and it's of course challenging to find some some connections between them. Um, uh, I thought about the growth mindset as a potential for the, let's say, the cultural values that might be now bec have become more relevant in the context of uh, recent times. Um, I'm not sure if that's the connection, but I would like to ask a question to Mike about um, the changing the changing nature of cultural capital. Um, for me, so, so when I heard your talk, I think I thought it was very clear and also very clever to think about um, what is cultural capital these days. What, what should it be if we want to understand, let's say, social reproduction? And you know, in the context of rising economic inequalities, 
I thought this story could be towards saying that maybe there's some sort of revival of economic values of, or an economic thinking about um, the dominant culture, which would then be um, an important culture that would then be transmitted across generations. However, when you gave your examples at the end of your talk, the, like multicultural values, cosmopolitanism, uh, urbanism, hip, hipster culture, uh, for me, these were not so clearly connected to this, this revival of e economic thinking or economic uh, reproduction. So, so what's your take on, on the nature of this new cultural change? So what is the cultural capital now in terms of these you know, um, uh, domains of reproduction, economic versus cultural or others? Um, a related question is the role of technology. You didn't say much about that. One could perhaps think that today, Technology and knowledge about technology is such an important, or even you know, cultural that is that is supportive of, of technology, is might be also a very new, let's say, emerging kind of culture that could could explain reproduction in in ways that have that are more contemporary than let's say the Bourdieuian uh, 1960s work. So these are my questions to you, please. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, lots of, like I could say a lot because this is an area where there's a lot of research, but to be honest, there's a lot more research needs to be done. I think, but beginning with your last point about technology, uh, that's absolutely right. So this notion of emerging cultural capital, which I talked about at the end, is very much the idea you've got to be savvy with knowing how to use devices, you know, how to how, knowing how to get your hands on information. If I can go back to that study I mentioned by Seamus Khan, which is kind of a very famous study about how um, top American private school operates. And his point is that the way privilege is organized in that school isn't by you know, steeping the children in Shakespeare and you know the great classics. I mean they, they of course they cover that in passing, but they also cover lots of other things too. So it's exactly kind of in some ways um the line of kind of things David was talking about. It's about it's about encouraging more fluid mindsets about you know it's about being flexible. Uh, so in a way, what they're doing is they're really putting, putting the focus on knowing how to use whatever technology at your disposal to, to access things quickly, which is, of course, the exact skill which you need in so many professional settings these days. You know, here we are in academia, then you've got to learn how to use Zoom, and you've got to link different databases together. And so that's the argument. You've got, you've got to be adept, not about knowing the core. You've got, sure, you've got to know the core, core stuff, but you've also got to be flexible across different domains of knowledge and expertise. Uh, and that depends upon technical expertise, which often the older generation uh, are less were le less well uh, developed in. So I think that's important. Um, in terms of, yes, I know you're exactly right, there's a kind of paradox, I think, which is that I was making the point that the return of capital, the return of wealth and equality is about the renewal of stocks of assets from the past. And you might expect that to lead to a more conservative culture, whereas in fact, it's much more of a hip and trendy and hipster. You now let's, let's engage with what's going on in the world, which, we, which we're finding. But I still think those old values, those kind of dynastic values about family, about you know, family comes first. Thinking about how you know how you, for instance, elaborate certain notions of uh, economic literacy, financial literacy, savings, accumulation, buying houses is actually pretty instilled in privileged kids these days. So those, those notions, I think, are established. I mean, one of the arguments by some other scholars thinking about this issue is kind of the way in which certain, certain values about the power of finance and you know, what it means to be um, a literate person in terms of understanding economic literacy is, is, is kind of crucial. But also knowing data sources, you know, knowing how to access data, knowing how to do graphs, all these things become familiar with, all become a, a part of common mastery. So I think, um, yes, I mean, I think it's a bit challenging because it, I mean, it's, it's very much an issue which is being discussed. And I'm currently working on a paper with uh, collaborators in Norway and Denmark on this precisely this issue. Um, and there's a very interesting study by um, Magna Flemen and some colleagues of a top Norwegian private school, again, an ethnographic study. And the argument there is still this classic, this kind of notion of a classic culture based upon a, based upon a kind of canon canonical immersion in literature and in the canon is still very strong. So I think we are, you know, we still have to do more work in this area. If I can just finish with one side side comment, actually, because I really enjoyed um, Sharon and David's talk, even though we're from different disciplines and some ways different framings, but I thought Sharon's uh, 
really, really important discussion about how so many poor pe poor young people are in the global south. Uh, is really interesting to contrast with what I was talking about because we have rich, wealthy, older people in the global north who have so much power and resource um, pitted against um, you know, a much a very different situation in the global south. And so even though that by some metrics there's been a kind of equalization between the global south and the global north, as you see these growth rates in China and India and places, actually we're still seeing these really big stocks of stock for capital having a very, very strong uh, differentiation between north and south. And that becomes more clear, I think, when you think about uh, wealth and capital rather than just income. It's clear in income too, but it's really interesting. I was very struck by Sharon's finding there. Vicky, you wanted to ask a question? Then we will move to Ninka and Tim uh, online. Uh, well, let me uh, uh, briefly say that I enjoyed all three talks and I'm really amazed how you could keep our attention because we're here now for two uh, hours and as all of you know, the attention span is 20 minutes. So we are still with you. So it, this is a great compliment. Now, my question is to uh, David. Uh, um, the first day of, uh, when new graduate students come to our graduate school, the first thing we tell them is that in our graduate school, we want you to have a learning goal and not a performance goal. That is a Dweckian uh, introduction. And um, my question to you is, uh, since you, are you were talking about uh, uh, making it big with, uh, with context, uh, wouldn't it be better to really concentrate indeed on the institutional side, or more on the institutional side, um, to, to see whether you could uh, get organizations to submit to interventions such that they would treat their employees with this message when they come in and while they are there and adapt their institutions to, uh, to this uh, growth or to what, what I would call a, a learning goal, which is, the, uh, which is the same thing. You also found that it was really having teachers who had this, uh, this goal that made the, made the difference. So that uh, move up into organizations on the broad way and maybe uh, concentrate less on teaching kids uh, what would you say to that? Yeah, that's fabulous. I, I, first of all, I hope you do that study uh, with your institution. And, I, and one takeaway for everyone in the audience is that we all have a role to play. We are powerful people at our universities. We often have say in who gets included in our programs and in our fields. And if we portray those fields as a place where only a few people with natural brilliance who happen to walk in with all the advantages in the world get to succeed, then we end up wasting so much scientific talent and creating such an exclusive place that narrows the value and impact of our science. So I think we all have a responsibility as culture creators simply because we have power and, and influence. Um, in addition, it's a really important empirical research agenda to focus on changing the leaders, not just the individual students. Mary Murphy has been leading this work. She tied together the concepts of stereotype threat from Claude Steele with the concept of mindset. And she argued that when leaders in organizations portray a fixed mindset culture, it creates the specter of stereotype threat. If you feel like if I make a mistake on this team that I'm gonna be outed as not smart enough, then that, that coincides with stereotypes about who's supposed to succeed. Um, so what are the interesting empirical questions? Uh, we have launched projects with faculty members and we've randomized them to get a version of the Texas Mindset Initiative treatment that I showed you. Where we're getting a lot of traction is with undergraduate learning assistants. So imagine a chemistry class with 3,000 students. Professors can't reach them all, but they're in small discussion groups of 10 to 20. So we randomized the discussion group leaders to get growth mindset and inclusion training. And we found really striking effects, especially for students of color, but the leaders themselves like the college more and like the field more 
and then they want to get into teaching. So there's kind of benefits all around whenever you go from thinking of mindset as a trait to something as a cultural variable that we need to work on with leaders. So I think you have you have really identified a critical, important and interesting research area. And I hope you do it and tell me what you find. Okay, thank you very much. Before we go, we go to Ninka and Tim, I just want to double check. Um, I know Mike has to leave at nine. Um, David and Sharon, will you be able to stay on for, let's say, five more minutes? I have just a couple minutes, yes. Okay, thank you. You too, Sharon? Okay, thank you. That's great. I'm not sure if you have to leave, Mike, but if you, if you do, uh, thanks a lot uh, for contributing today. It means a lot. And uh, I'm really excited that uh, we were able to bring together sociologists and sociologists uh, today. Um, I mean sociologists and psychologists uh, to address this question of inequality. Thank you, Mike. Ninke. Okay, can you hear me? There you are, yes. Ah, thank you. Um, so I'll keep my uh, question uh, short. I have a question for David. Um, thanks a lot for your inspiring uh, talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, did you in all your uh, growth mindset intervention studies ever observe any negative impacts um, of the growth mindset message related to, uh, for example, increased feelings of responsibility or children blaming themselves uh, for not achieving uh, as you teach them that, um, you know, it's under their own, their own influence? Or do you always emphasize the, the limits of malleability? And I was also wondering if uh, this uh, came up in your interactions with teachers uh, about these interventions. Yeah, so empirically, no, we don't find them, but that's because we're obsessed with this question. Observationally, I see things all the time that make me cringe. I see parents blame kids for not having a growth mindset, teachers blaming kids, like, why aren't you trying hard? You should have a growth mindset. I see people handing out growth mindset worksheets saying, here's a fixed mindset, here's a growth mindset, you should have the growth one. And that creates kind of ostracism for kids who are often given reason to doubt their abilities because of their position in, in a culture. So I tend to worry a lot about turning fixed mindset into a flaw of an individual because it's like it's a learned adaptation it's a social cognitive adaptation to an environment in many ways so we're really worried about that um and i think that uh any intervention needs to take that design challenge very seriously um uh and that's one reason why we we tend to be do our experiments in really controlled ways because I kind of, I don't necessarily want lots of homebrew mindset treatments because people could get that wrong and cause lots of harm. But no, we haven't found it in our studies. Tim, is Tim still there? He's gone. Oh, there is Tim. Okay, just not with his hand raised. I, I just want to make sure you, you, you wanted to ask a question. Yes. So please, you should... Please feel free to unmute yourself. I'm much Can you do that? Thank you, Eddie. I, I just thought time is running out, so... Uh, oh, no, sure. We uh, have, we have a few more minutes. Well, thanks. Um, so, so personally, I'm very much interested in uh, classroom interaction and, well, let's say classroom management. So I think it's really amazing what uh, Sharon is achieving, apparently, in, in these classrooms. Um, but my question, again, is, is for David. So um, do you have any information or did you do observations in your study about what actually the changes were in, in the classroom? So what changed in, in how teachers taught their lessons and interacted with students? I would be very curious to know. Do you have any information on that? Yes, I do. And I, I want to echo your comment about Sharon's work, which I also loved. <laughs> so thanks, Sharon. Uh, so the um, we have collected the artifacts from the teachers. So one of, one of our uh, uh, questions to them is write a first day speech so that when you explain your policy for requiring revision and resubmission of math homework, 
explain to students is not because you're trying to give them more work and you you are a perfectionist that dislikes them. Explain it's because you believe that all students can learn the material. And that's why you're going to give them multiple opportunities. So they all write a speech that they give. And so we have copies of those. But then how does a speech turn into a culture? That happens when teachers post the speech and continue talking about it for the rest of the year. And it becomes a cultural artifact that people look at and revisit. Some teachers do that and some teachers don't. And that's where it's kind of a black box. It's really hard to observe those tacit ways that te teachers idiosyncratically um, uh, use, use these practices. Um, and so the so we've measured a lot, but it, my my read on the teacher observation literature, like in the the MET study, the Gates Foundation MET study, is apart from figuring out whether the class is totally out of control or not, it's just really hard to get fine distinctions. Um, this is, I think one of Pam Grossman's findings too is it's like you can you can identify the bottom twenty five percent of classrooms where kids are hanging from the rafters. But distinguishing the top 75% on almost any dimension that's that's subtle is really hard. So um, I think what I'm going to bet on next is thinking carefully about natural language processing and AI tools that allow us to learn from exceptional teachers in the language they're using, see if we can train language models, and then create new tools to try to inform teachers when it gets struggling, what to, what works to say to them. But I don't know if, if I have to run, but if you do you have any ideas for us or is there something you've already thought of that you think is important? Well, it, it's an occupational hazard because I'm very much uh, looking in, uh, from the perspective of, of relationships between teachers and students. So, so this really small example, I think, in, in reaction to uh, Ninka's uh, question is someone says, well, you should have a, a growth mindset. That's the same message. Uh, in words, but but uh, re relational wise, it's 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 really like uh, almost hostile, right? So so, uh, I I would bet that there must be something also in the in in the mindset of of how you relate to students and how you talk to them and and that they're maybe more like equals or, or something like that. I would yeah. guess must be going on in these classrooms, so so that there's a more friendly or more more welcoming atmosphere or something like that. I, I will be right. curious. Uh, it's not just friendliness. That's a little tricky because there are lots of teachers that are friendly but have low standards, and they're like, "Oh, I'm sorry, it's too hard for you. Just you know, memorize and do the easy things." Right? No, not everyone's a math person. Um, no, you need to combine so it, of course, something... with applying structure and 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 and, and giving. Uh, resources and so on of course so just being friendly wouldn't do of course yeah yeah but that's why it's hard is because a lot that it's easy to code if someone's friendly or mean but there are a lot of ways to be friendly with low standards and to be kind of cold but still supportive and maintaining a high standard or really not cold but just not affectionate and um so so I, yeah, I've just been, I've been studying bright spots. I, I've been taught. There's a physics teacher named Sergio Estrada. He's from El Paso, Texas, and I just I look at what he says to his students when he texts them, and it's like they're stuck on a physics problem at 10 p.m. and they're crying. Like, what does Sergio say? You know, he never gives them the answer. He's like, okay, so you have this part. Well, what does what does this mean? And he asks like four questions, and then they get it. And I'm like. That girl's crying and it's 10 o'clock and you didn't even tell her the answer. That's amazing. <laughs> but he never wants to deprive a student of the knowledge that they can get it. And that subtle interaction is like, it's hard to pick up in natural variation unless you have a very precise lens. So I think we're at the beginning stages of knowing what even what you would code for. Um, and uh, so that's kind of where I feel like this is one of the next big puzzles. We, we wrote a series of working papers on this with the OECD and PISA. And one of them is on the, the measurement challenges that, that I can send to Eddie and Eddie can forward because um, it's, it's a really tricky thing to figure out. Maybe one last thing. So, so the warm demand idea, so, so being friendly, but also being demanding exactly. and, and, and letting new students know that you really want something from them, that, that might be uh, an interesting concept in, in that. Uh, I think that's, that's one of the most powerful and most underappreciated concepts in all of psychology. 
and it works with parenting, you know, authoritative parenting. And, and I think it works with how teenagers want to be treated. You know, they want to be respected, not looked down on, but they want to be supported too. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks, um, David and Sharon for staying a little longer. Oh, I saw 10 versions of myself. That's a bit traumatic, but um, 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 so this was a really exciting meeting. Um, and I really hope that this is a starting point for further discussion of how we can address inequality, also combining insights from different disciplines. And um, I really feel like two hours is not enough uh, to discuss this issue. So I hope there will be a follow up. Thanks a lot for everybody who joined online, even though it's already 9 p.m. And, uh, and to all the speakers today. Thank you very much.